Welcome to Attacking Third. We have another massive show for you with NWSL quarterfinals getting underway tonight. We'll have a full breakdown of both matches. But first, I'm your host, Jenny Chu, with Christine Kupo and Darian Jenkins. And it's Footy Kit Friday, which means we got to introduce our kits. Darian, would you like to get us started? I would love to. Shout out to World Soccer Shop for my dope PSG kit. I've got Mbappe in the back. And I've been told it kind of fits in the spooky season. A little it's, Halloween esque. It's a little webby, but it's like, you know, like a trendy webby, like high fashion webby. I like that serving. But you have the best kit by far today. I am winning Footy Kit Friday today. I don't care what anybody says. Um, yeah, Michi uh, Milano um, have hooked me up with the one, the only, the Olivier Giroud. Keeper kit. Yeah, so, it's dope. That's a play. Nobody is beating That is me a rare find today. for sure. As are the leather chaps. I, I, yes, we, we're also going horseback riding <laughs> yeah. to the <laughs> I have to give you your credit, even though I'm wearing Inter, and obviously Inter and AC Milan don't love each other. Mm -hmm. The They're fact the that you have Giroud. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that you have Giroud's goalkeeper kit and the amazing save he made blocking his face um, on that save he was amazing. He and I do like, keep similarly in that I do it blindly in one hand. <laughs> but I, I've been practicing, right? Because you can't wear the kit and not do Giroud justice, right? So I haven't nailed his celebration, right? Like I try to do the like, you know? But I have the <laughs> wink, right? Ready? Wait, wait, here's the wink, ready? I don't think anyone can replicate Giroud's <laughs> blink because it's a little How bit of his hair you? as well. Oh, so you have great hair, hair but Giroud's hair kind of makes everything <laughs> he does. But we have a lot of news, and we are going to start in the NWSL. According to reports, Vladko Antonovsky will be the new head coach of the Kansas City Current. The former U.S. Women's National Team head coach had previously coached FC Kansas City to back-to-back -to -back NWSL titles in 2014 and 2015. Prior to taking charge of the national team, Andonovsky was head coach of OL Reign, who he led to consecutive playoff berths. Um, this news that is just coming out today, I know we sometimes mention that we kind of expected that Vladko would go back. Darian, I know you said one time, let's be real, we think Vladko's going back to Kansas yes. City. What do you think? Oh, yeah, 100%. I think I'm shocked this hasn't been announced already, but breaking news, is it? Uh, yeah, I'm not surprised he's back at Kansas City. It's his hometown. He's had so much success. They have a huge co coaching vacancy, um, a new stadium. Why not go start this with a bang with a really successful club coach, former national team coach, Flacco Donoski. I've said before, he's probably my favorite coach I've ever had in my playing career. I think he is super developmental with every player. He's tactically super smart. I, I would say genius, um, loves the game, has so much passion. So I think they made the right choice. I'm happy for Kansas City. I hope this gives them the boost they need for next season because they have such a talented roster. But yeah, I am not surprised at all. No, I, like you, not surprising. I think it, it's the most logical leap, right? Mm -hmm. he's, he's extremely successful in his club career. And I think he'll continue to be, right? Yeah. Just because you don't make it at a national team level doesn't mean that you're not still wildly impressive yeah. in your home base, which I think that was his sort of the cream of his crop there. Yeah, everything works out. Yeah, I think that players, or not players, I guess spectators that have not known anything about Blotko in the club level, but have only known him with a national team, may not understand why people are like, yeah, that makes sense. Because yeah. he has, you know, the career there and winning the titles and everyone who's played for him has great things to say there. But with the national team, it's a completely different thing. Mm -hmm. But continuing that in international play, a legend of the game, Olympic gold medalist Christine St. Clair will be retiring from international soccer at the end of the year. Sinclair has played 327 matches for the Canadian national team, notching 190 goals, which is the current all-time record in international football for any man or woman. Can we please give our respects to the legend that is Christine Sinclair? For sure, it, it hurts the heart a little bit, right? She's sort of this pivotal figure in women's soccer who, you know, we all grew up watching. Mm -hmm. She's always been part of this landscape. She's had so many accomplishments that she just has set the bar so so high, both within Canada and for club team. And I know that we will still have her with Portland for a while, but it, it kind of marks the end of an era. I feel like all of the players that we sort of grasped onto that have been significant are starting to retire. It's it's hard. Yeah, it's a new, it's a this big wave of players that are retiring, these giants that you don't think of women's soccer without thinking of these players, the Juilliards, the Megan Rapino, the Marta, the Christine Sinclair. So it's sad, it's bittersweet, but I'm happy for her. She gets to retire on her own terms, but she's brought so much to the women's game. We talked about her being the fundamentalist of football. You like so many players that are coming after her, Quinn, Jesse Fleming, that play in the midfield for Canada that have similar attributes of how they're so clean on the ball. They, they simplify the game. They 
drive, they score goals. So I think she's influenced not only those players, but women's football around the world. Not even just women's football, football around the world. Yeah. And I'm happy for her. I'm happy I've gotten to play against her because she is a legend. And what was that like? Oh, awful. <laughs> I, could, I couldn't touch her. I'm pretty sure she scored and I was marking her. Roll tape. Uh, yeah, uh, to, please don't, please don't. It was terrible. <laughs> yeah, she played in six World Cups, scoring in five of them, and like you mentioned, a fundamentalist. Not mm. really a, a flashy player, just doing her role correctly, which allowed everyone else around her to flourish. We saw that at Portland and with Canada. So, saying goodbye to a legend, but she will still be playing with the Portland Thorns, so we can continue to watch her there. Uh, in Europe, the UEFA Women's Champions League group stage draw has taken place with with 16 teams being split into four groups. Matches for match day one will take place on November 14th and 15th. And like often happens in any tournament, we have a group of death with Group C featuring Bayern Munich, PSG, Roma, and Ajax. Initial reactions to these groups here, Darian. Woe and woe. Not only is Group C the group of death, I think Group D, Chelsea, Real Madrid, Hacken, and Paris FC. Perry FC are knocking people out left and right. The big shots, Wolfsburg, Arsenal, and they don't look like they're slowing down anytime soon. I think that's going to be a really interesting group because you also have uh, Linda Caicedo and Haley Rasso from Real Madrid. So fun to watch. I love this time of year. We love Champions League. It's a lot of football. I think for me, I have my eyes on Roma. I feel like you cannot discount them. They are the reigning Scudetto winners from last season. They're currently top of the table in Serie A Femenile um, with four wins in four matches. Uh, Diego Liamo have been, has just been on fire, um, just goal scoring. And then they also have Kumagai and a few other really, really impressive players that I think they're, they're kind of coming into their own at this point, right? Right. Paris SV FC making all of these headlines lately, taking out Arsenal, taking out Wolfsburg. Uh, I know you played in the French League, Darian. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about that kind of success? I love it. I think when you think of Dua Marquema, you obviously think about Bordeaux, PSG, and Lyon. And Paris FC making a name for themselves. They're in this Champions League. I love it. I think it's big for the growth of the game um, because typically in other leagues, there's a couple of teams that dominate, so it's nice to see that wealth being spread, and I hope it just keeps building, and I, I really hope that they make it past this group stage. I feel like with them having knocked out Arsenal, like I kind of have to, you know what, if you're going to yeah. lose to a team, then they better be the best. They better win. <laughs> they better win it all. We know you're an Arsenal fan, so we'll, be, <laughs> we'll follow that story, but on Wednesday, part two of Carly Lloyd's episode on Kicking It aired on the Golazo Network. We're going to discuss some of what the two-time World Cup winner had to say, including talking about her family, um, her personal coach and how that relationship fractured her family and so much more. Stay with us. So I was talking to my sister uh, for about four years when my book came out. She was about to give birth to her first and she called me um, Take a second. She called me and left me a voicemail. Um, yeah, and I'll never forget it. She said she didn't want her firstborn to not know her aunt. Carly Lloyd joined the Kicking It crew and discussed her career as well as her relationship with her family and mentioned um, a lot of about her personal trainer that her dad had hired for her um, that eventually led to the split between her family. And she stopped talking to her family. And, and it seemed like what she was saying was that that coach basically decided that, that her family was not good for her. And she continued to prioritize her career and chose the trainer over her family for about 10 years of her career, 12 years, I think is what she said. Um, I know that that all kind of affected us and all of our relationships with our families. It was kind of just created some emotion for us. And, and I think my initial emotion was, was I feel bad for her because that's such a difficult position to be in. I feel like for me, she, you know, it's very insightful for sure, a lot of the things that she said, because she emphasizes in more than one instance that she had a singular focus. And so uh, all of the things that make her the killer athlete that she's been are due to that 
killer focus. And unfortunately, with that, yeah, you ha eventually probably do have a lot of regrets in hindsight, just based on the fact that like so much did fall to the side, right? Like. The same mentality that um, Michael Jordan had when he played that he's very unapologetic about where it's you win, there's success, you move forward, you move forward with me as a team, and that's our role, is, is very similar to her outlook, it seems. Yeah. And so I, I think that it's hard to navigate that looking at it from the outside because now she's retired, right? Your perspective on your past life where you've achieved all of this is gonna change significantly than when you're chasing this rabbit, right? I, I feel for her because she even related in a way that was similar. She said she understood how the NWSL when the Yates investigation report came out. And all of this stuff came to light that players in the league knew for a long time, but it always fell on deaf ears. Uh, and so to finally have the support to speak out on it and to show support for these players, and she said that she, that really resonated with her, she understood it. My heart broke for her a little bit because imagine this coach came into her life when she was a teenager because it was after she didn't make the roster for U20 World Cup, I believe mm -hmm. she said. She was 18, 19 years old, maybe, maybe a little younger. And that's a really tough time where you can be molded. We've all been in high stakes situations with football at points in our lives at that time and it's you can easily be manipulated because you're just you're striving for greatness you're obsessed with it this is the future you have so much so much in front of you and especially a player like her someone getting into the interweavings of your mind and pushing you so far away from your family i'm yeah my heart breaks for her a little bit with hearing that um and i'm glad that she's separated from that coach because i'm sure there's a lot of mental emotional abuse that went on to push you that far to separate from your family for 12 years yeah. is crazy, but I'm, I'm happy that she's repaired that relationship and now has that relationship because you saw how it really hit her like that. It was a huge part. I've never seen yeah. her emotional. Before. She, she missed a, a lot in, in those 12 years yeah. without her family. But I think the most important part for me is what you mentioned there is that she's relating it to the NWSL mm -hmm. because it is very similar in the sense that we can be manipulated. Um, you know, we are all potential victims of people who have that kind of power over us. You're talking about her being at a young age, mm -hmm. her being vulnerable, her deciding that this is my number one goal. And being, and you can tell from her personality of, across these two episodes, she is so goal oriented and she will do anything to do what she needs to do to be the best in her, what she's striving to be, right? And if her coach is telling her the only way you can do that is to cut off your family and that is what your goal is, you're, all you're doing is thinking about how can I be the best? Yeah. And he's right. telling you they have to go I, I feel bad for her because we can all be victim of a bad influence coming into our lives mm -hmm. that we think is is there for us and is thinking, you know, to make our lives better and enhance our lives. And instead, they are tear, tearing us down and isolating us, mm -hmm. which I think is what happened to Carly. She got isolated from her teammates. She got isolated from her family. And then she becomes this very hard, not emotional human that we see as a competitor. I think there still needs to be some amount of accountability for her because she okay. still has chosen all of those things, right? At any point, she can veer out of this course, right? You are still largely responsible for your own decisions. So, yes, you can concede a bit. What I will say is I think it's reasonable to believe that she, at this impasse in her life, has now taken stock of all of the things that she maybe made concessions on mm -hmm. and regrets having done it. That doesn't mean that she regrets it in the moment because it, she arrived at the destination that she wanted to arrive at. You know, she would not have been the Carly Lloyd that we know if she didn't follow that path, if she didn't have these killer instincts, if she didn't sort of yield to this. But yes, it's much easier to manipulate a player when you have the, the desired carrot dangling from a stick to get yeah. them to believe, you, you know, this is the one true way forward. Mm -hmm. um, that's not uncommon, right? You see yeah. it very often, especially on players that are bright rising because it's a lot easier to get in on the youth side because they are so amenable to people who seemingly know better. Mm -hmm. um, it's so weird though because her dad brought this coach into her life, right? And we all know that, like my dad was a huge advocate of my career, but we talk about uh, Rory Dame's situation, for example. And when we read in the investigation, which I read from top to bottom, there were players, um, young players, who their parents were around when the coach was yelling these absurd things to them and, and saying all of these things, but their parents thought that the goal is there and he is the ticket to the goal and we are going to accept whatever happens until we get there. And I mm -hmm. think that that's something that my biggest message is that's not okay. You don't realize it's not okay until you hear it back and I'm like, wow, the amount of abuse that I 
yeah. withstood because I thought that was a part of it. You mm -hmm. don't get there until you take it. Yeah. Is it something that we, a lot of us have stood by and accepted? I think it makes, it made car, it made her make a lot more sense to me because yeah. I already, I, I like her because I think she's very cut and dry uh, and she's just gonna give it to you straight and that's how she's gonna say it and that's how she's gonna do it. If you like it, okay. If you don't, that's okay too. Uh, so I think understanding that that's been ingrained in her from such a young age to be successful and then she has won everything. She's one of the most mm -hmm. decorated players to ever play women's football. It, it humanizes her in a way where I have, like I, un I can understand how, why she is the way she is now. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, her successes have justified all of her decisions, and she mm -hmm. does mention that in the second part of this episode, where you know she even says, you know, having that coach and knowing what I do now, and knowing that even U.S. Soccer didn't want me to be working with him, that they thought that my training was adequate. Adequate. We were going above and beyond, but it was working for me. It was giving her the success she needed, and so that was that for her. Yeah. Even her husband, you know, who, who entered her life a long time ago, was not a big fan of him, but that's a, something that she needs, and. I just feel like the biggest thing, I, I think that these episodes with Carly really humanized her, like you said there, Darian, and it's really important to kind of understand, um, only because so many of us are in those situations. It doesn't have to be a woman soccer player. It doesn't have to be a woman. It doesn't have to be a soccer player. Just the dynamics at play are very common. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of us have been in relationship with narcissists and, and don't really recognize when you're in it until you walk out of it that, hey, yeah, that wasn't great You for see me. all the signs. Yeah. yeah. The only part of the part two that I didn't, agree with, I thought she was contradictory of herself, is where she said she didn't want to kneel for her last game because it was distracting, trying to be about herself. Because the, like, take the discussion out of the anthem. This, the anthem wasn't playing, this was just 10 seconds before kickoff, you kneel for three to five seconds. I didn't really like that part. I, I just, it didn't make sense to me. I thought she was contradictory. I wish she would have given, like, I just didn't, yeah, whatever. I mean, I, I agree with you, but yeah, I also just it, don't, I disagree fundamentally with her speaking out and saying that it was a distraction because that's a unique position of privilege to be able to consider that a distraction. And that would have been the point too where why wouldn't you want to end your career like showing solidarity with your yeah. teammates of color and the opponents of color that you're playing against when it's not even about the anthem at that point. It didn't make, it really didn't make any sense to me but to each their own, I, yeah, that's the only part I didn't, No, I, I, think I didn't really care for during the interview. But I think that's the point. I think the point is to allow everyone to stand by what they've done, and she seems to stand by it. She says she has no regrets. If she did it again, would she do it the same way? She said yes. Mm -hmm. um, I really sympathize with her because, as she mentioned with the NWSL, I've experienced abusive coaches. I know so many players in the league have. Coaches that I've had that are mentioned in the Yates report that really got away with um, being emotionally, verbally, mentally abusive. Um, there's even times where I've gone to training, called my mom on the way there crying, just so upset that I didn't want to go. And then on the way home, calling my mom again, just saying, you know what, I'm, this is what was said to me. I feel sick to my stomach. I feel like quitting. Maybe I should go play abroad again. Um, and this, this isn't an isolated incident. And it's, it's difficult being on a team too, especially where you're around teammates and players that when you're younger, who you think are have power and of influence, but that are also being manipulated by these coaches. And it causes, it causes this like very distrusting environment where this should be the place where you're thriving. You feel the most like yourself, where it's your space of freedom and creativity and you're bonding with your teammates. And I, yeah, I really sympathize with her because it can drive such a wedge in your relationships and something that's supposed to bring you the utmost happiness. This is, that's why we play soccer. It's not a necessary job. We do this for fun because we love it, because we have passion for it. So for someone to see that and manipulate it and drive you away from people closest to you is really heartbreaking because I know I've experienced that firsthand. I know you guys have as well. And so many players, unfortunately, have experienced that too. Darren, do you think that post Yates report mm -hmm. world that girls and women are better positioned to understand these sort of unseen costs at chasing their dream and a better way to navigate it it's, going forward. It's scary because I think there's such a drive to be the best and you see players that are so young jumping into skipping college and going pro or signing all these big contracts where it leaves a huge, a huge amount of space for this, these vulnerable 
this vulnerable position and these master manipulators to come in and take advantage of that, which is really scary. But I do think the Yates report has done a lot of work to show signs of this is what an abusive coach looks like, this is what they sound like, you should never tolerate X, Y, and Z. Now you're seeing players that have platforms that speak out about it and we're having conversations like this mm -hmm. that are gonna change the game and I hope people hear this and feel inspired and feel seen and know that they don't have to tolerate abuse and the many forms that it comes in. Uh, but yeah, I think we have a really long way to go but I do think it brought light and some knowledge to what can go and what can't go anymore. I completely agree with you there. You know, I was speaking to some parents the other day and, and it came up um, as part of our game and they said we all had really important conversations with our daughters. And to be honest, when I was young, that's not a conversation that I had with my parents. Yeah. I had no idea what abuse looked like. I had no idea that that was inappropriate, that I should not be in X situations with, you don't know until you know. And I think that it's so great that, obviously not that it happened, but that it, it's it's become a dialogue mm -hmm. um, and now we're speaking about it and now other kids can say, hey, you know what, this feels wrong, I'm raising my hand, I don't know, you know, Darian said that when they yell at you like this, what does this mean? Yeah. Um, so I know I've talked a lot to play, uh, lots of players who quit NWSL and they just feel so negatively about the game because of the abuse that they endured and in those conversations I'm promising that, hey, apparently things are better, you know, they're trying to change things and I do hope that that's the case, and I hope that we continue to push that forward. But I know that there's some resentment in seeing, you know, your fellow teammates watch you maybe be talked down to or abused in certain mm -hmm. ways emotionally and them not speaking up. Yeah. What it, can you say for that? I think it's, it's tough because I know, I think now being outside of it, I used to hold a lot of, I won't say resentment, but like a lot of hurt that I couldn't let go of because I think now... I could never let somebody speak to you in a crazy way because you messed up in a passing pattern. That's insane. No one deserves to be spoken to in that way for kicking a ball the wrong way. Come on. So I think those players that I used to look at and have so much hurt for, I also know we're in a really scary position because if you spoke out, well, you're at the bottom of the barrel now. Well, you're not going to play. You'll be kicked out of training. Oh, you, you, you want to try to get traded? No, I'm going to keep you here. Yeah. So... Everyone's in a scary position and I get that, but I think there's been so much work and we're having these really important conversations and creating space for each other that now when you see something, you say something and there's a lot more room to affect change in a really positive way. But I think a lot of that starts with people in power, ownership, GMs, hiring people that are qualified for positions that actually have the human to human skills that don't abuse power because yeah. that they are in positions of power. I think the common denominator that both of you hit on is is the ability to open a dialogue. Yeah. And that's important in eradicating that both silence and fear cycle mm -hmm. that continues to keep these systems in place. And at the very least, that advances women in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. And hopefully, at the very least, empowers them to be able to know mm -hmm. that you know this isn't acceptable people management at yeah. the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Darian, thank you for sharing that. I know it's not easy to talk about any of these situations, but thank you to Carly Lloyd for joining, kicking it, and sparking this conversation. You can stream that now on the Golasso Network where we come back. North Carolina Courage midfielder Brianna Pinto joins us. Stay with us. Carolina Courage have already won one trophy this year when they lifted the Challenge Cup earlier this season. Now they're back in the playoffs on the hunt for another title. Here to discuss the Courage's upcoming match, we have Brianna Pinto here with us. Welcome in, fellow Tar Heel. Thank you. Pleasure to see you all. I saw you smiling during that little highlight there. 
I love scoring goals. It's always fun. Um, and then celebrating with my team is special. So hopefully we'll have several goals to show this weekend. You definitely have some goals, you know, this season. Um, but the North Carolina video that just aired a couple days ago on social media, did you see it? <laughs> yes. About yes, I did. proving the doubters wrong. Uh, tell me about what you guys have done this season in proving everyone wrong. I think for us, it's about like buying into our culture and we wanted to focus on the details every single day in training and fig figure out how we could become 1% better every single day. And I think everybody did an incredible job uh, just throughout the course of this season, supporting each other, working as hard as they possibly could so that our product on the field uh, could be the best that it is. And um, I'm really proud of just how the team has grown over the course of the season because we stayed true to um, our values and we improved and um, the product has proved to be really, really great. The product has definitely proved to be immaculate. Even in those highlights, uh, when I played for the Pride, one of those goals you scored was against me. I was like, oh, dang. But I love that. <laughs> <laughs> we interviewed Coach Sean Nehas uh, about a month ago around the Challenge Cup, and he talked about the culture, the mentality that is the North Carolina Courage and how you train the exact way that you're gonna play. How has that helped you develop in your personal game? I think for us, uh, we always train in tight spaces. We want everybody to be comfortable on the ball and, uh, and um, find ways to evade pressure. And I think our team has done a wonderful job doing that. Uh, we have footballers all across the field who uh, want to share the ball, want to play a beautiful brand of the game. And um, I think that's a testament to the way we were set up in training and just the work ethic that we have. We want to be the fittest team in the league, but we also want to be a team um, that you know, breaks down opponents and finds good ways to score. And um, I'm just really proud of the variety that we've shown this year and just the commitment all across the board from the coaching staff, our support staff, and then all the players. Now, speaking of your goals, you had the scrappiest second half stoppage time <laughs> hero, movement, hero movement, right, for the courage in the semifinal of the Challenge Cup. What was going through your head at that moment? Because you were absolutely determined. You could see it. Yeah, I got subbed into that game and they said, go change the game. And uh, that's exactly what I was going to do. Um, we were headed to penalties if we didn't find a way to get that goal. And um, it was actually Haley Hopkins that told me to be in the box because she challenged for the initial ball um, that was thrown in from Kaylee Kurtz. And um, if it weren't for her, I might have been like at the top of the box. But um, I found myself in a good position to score and um, we battled for the ball inside the 18 yard box and it popped out on my foot. And the first thing I could think was shoot it to the back post. And uh, when it went in, I was absolutely ecstatic. I think that was a big moment for our team because we wanted to go back to the Challenge Cup championship and to win it back to back years was incredible. Oh, for sure. You had 80 French punch and air back there. You saw that hole and went for it. Um, and to that now, so you added one more trophy to your trophy cabinet. Do you have a bit of a competition running yet with your brother? Oh, man. Um, I never <laughs> thought about it that way. Uh, I think it's honestly a competition from, for myself because um, I, mean, I lost a few national championships on my home field um, in college, like the Wake Med, and um, to be two for two at the professional level on our field has been really, really cool. So just to host um, those big games um, and for us to win them uh, means a lot. So uh, for me personally, I just think it's like finding a way to show up with our team and um, give ourselves the best chance to compete for championships. But with my brothers, you know, I'm proud of them every step of the way, uh, all the things that they've done at the youth, collegiate, and pro levels. Hold on, hold on. So <laughs> your brother's a pro in the MLS. You obviously are pro in the NWSL. And I was trying to figure out where your parents are going to be this weekend because you're both playing this weekend. And what did you just tell me? They're at F1 this weekend. <laughs> uh, my mom works for a company that sponsors uh, one, of the team, uh, one of the teams that's uh, competing. So um, they're going to that. But um, they're huge uh, sports fans. Um, and F1 has been their latest thing. But um, for Malik and FC Cincinnati, uh, they have a big game this weekend. And uh, we're super proud of them because they won the MLS Shield. Um, and he's gotten some good minutes this year. And he's got a really group, great group of guys that support him. So I'm just so excited to follow them. Um, I've become a huge Cincinnati fan over the last <laughs> few years so it's been cool well shout out to Cincinnati what an incredibly talented family with a lot of success not only are you killing it on the field you're doing amazing work off of the field with the Pinto Football Foundation um, that invests in grassroots programs around locally and globally to make a little bit more access to football can you tell us a little bit more about the foundation and your inspiration behind starting this and the work that you're currently doing 
Yeah, I think for me, uh, soccer has changed my life in the most positive way. I've met incredible people. I've had a plethora of experiences that I will cherish for a lifetime. And uh, my greatest goal is to share that with others. I believe that football is a global game and um, it should look like the people that play all across the world. And I want people to know, especially in underserved communities, that they have a place in this game and that we will support them. Um, but for the sport of soccer in America, there are a lot of structural and financial barriers to participation and we want to help eradicate those. And um, in the last few pictures that you saw, um, we had a um, financial literacy course that was kid-friendly at Camp FC as a part of our nationwide event. And um, just to see them learning um, both on the field and off was incredibly special because, um, again, football can open so many doors for so many different people. And if I can be a part of that and leave a legacy throughout my career, I feel like that's a win. Brianna, I commend you so much for that, and that's obviously a massive effort that will be everlasting. But the last you and I had seen each other was actually at the USSF send-off prior to the Qatar World Cup, and we had chatted a bit about, um, I'm going to get the shirts printed, so Brianna Printo for USSF president, right? You'll take over the foundation, <laughs> take over the world then, too. We'll get you in the White House. <laughs> I just think, you know, the growth that we're going to have over the next uh, few years up until 2028 is going to be so special. And um, I just my greatest hope is that we make soccer the preeminent sport in the United States, which is the mission of U.S. soccer. And um, to have like the Copa America, the Club World Cup, the FIFA Men's World Cup, hopefully the Women's World Cup, and then eventually the L.A. Olympics in 2028, like, I think we have the most magnificent opportunity to make everyone a soccer fan in North America. So um, if I can play a role in getting more kids into that sport, like I, I think it'll be so, so special. So I can't wait. I'm excited at, both as a player and a fan. Okay, wow. Brianna for president. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> you listen, I agree. And we went to the same university. I'm thinking, I did not get the same education that you did there. Uh, you got a great education because you're changing the world in the soccer space. Oh, like, I you're the sweetest. No, no, no. I think it's so cool to see you all like transition from your own playing days into covering sports because, you know, this is what makes our sport so well known to new um, watchers of women's soccer, for example. And I think it makes a difference. So I really appreciate all three of you. Oh, well, Pinto, you're amazing. Yeah. Um, we'll be sure to watch you this weekend in your match. Good luck. Thank you so much for Thank joining us. So yes, lots of luck. Get it done. Good luck. All right, Thank like we guys. mentioned yeah. there, the quarterfinals get underway this weekend in the NWSL. When we come back, we're going to break down Sunday's match between Pintos, North Carolina Courage, and Gotham FC. Don't go anywhere. Gotham in the black, gunning for playoff spots. The Courage have an enviable trophy case with two NWSL titles, three shields, and two Challenge Cups. Gotham FC, on the other hand, have yet to score in a playoff game. But it's not history that will, taping, will be taking the field on Sunday at 7 p.m. So let's break down how the match could play out and which players could be the difference makers. Darian, let's go ahead and get started with you with North Carolina Courage in third place in playoffs mm -hmm. and um, Gotham finishing in sixth place in that last spot. Yeah, I think it's going to be an interesting match. It's the battle of the attacks because I think both of these teams, they that's where their real star power is, is in the attacks and how they're able to work together, break other teams down. And Gotham has the speed, the 1v1 ability, Esther coming in and being a showstopper, putting two goals away with her hold up play and just her, her work that she does even off of the ball, I think is a huge advantage to them. And then North Carolina on the other side has Narumi, who has been my player to watch for this side. I think she has been so integral in their success when she's been there. One goal, three assists going in. Um, she's been the glue for this NC midfield. I think she's a playmaker. She sets everybody else up. Um, she's, oh my gosh, that block. She is um, in the back third and the final third, gets there quickly and constantly. I think, you know, other keepers have had really good saves against her, honestly, because I think she should have many more goals and assists. But she is a workhorse and constantly moving up the field. So I'm excited to watch her. And then for this Gotham side, I think Yasmeen Ryan 
finally we saw her last game with some of the confidence that she had against or when she played for Portland. Um, she dribbled past three players. Watching those highlights at the beginning, I was like, ooh, ah, ooh. I was watching that game live. I love to see her with the confidence, with her going 1v1. I know playing this 10 position is new, but I think she's finally hit that sweet spot in the season where she is using her abilities in the most effective way in the attack, which is going 1v1 because 10s, you're expecting them to distribute the ball and work off the nines a little bit more. Triple girl. No, absolutely. Triple, get your shots off. Yeah, I like, love it. Finally. Absolutely. Like hit him with the bat signal. Yes. That one, I was like, oh, she's coming through. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, shoot. But I think that, her dribbling ability, 1v1, shooting, having a quick, bit of a quicker trigger like we saw last game, and then combining with the front three, Gotham's going to be scary to play against for this Courage squad. Absolutely. Christine, who are your players to watch in this one? My players to watch for the Courage up, Manaka Matsukubo. She's 19 years old. She obviously was the MVP of the Challenge Cup. She had that amazing goal off that volley, just beautiful banger. Um, and then she had the recent assist for this Washington Spirit game. She has so much capacity and she's so, so young that I'm just waiting to see what she does next. She has no hesitation running at back lines. She has an amazing capacity to create space and just like kind of carve out pockets for herself yeah. that she's going to be lethal. And again, she's only 19. So how do you see this one playing out? Because Derek Marianne gave us her breakdown there. I, I did, and obviously I also had Esther Gonzalez on my radar in, in terms of Gotham and just some of their potential strengths here, but I think that Courage could sweep this out. I mean, Ooh. obviously they have to play pretty smartly and uh, neutralize, I say isolate, isolate some of those key players for Gotham and they can get it done. I like it. Um, I chose for the North Carolina Courage, Emily Fox, um, left back for the national team, also for Gotham, and she's just been a mainstay for them on that team. And I, I love her defensive ability, and I played with her in college a little bit, and so I understand, like, her determination and the way that she is as a human, like, mm -hmm. on the field. She, whatever she needs to get done, she will get done. And she was left off of, I think, the World Cup roster a few years ago, and then she fought her way back onto the field um, just to see what she can do along that left side. She can get the crosses in, but mostly just like such a insanely scary defender to go up against, which you wouldn't think because she's so beautiful and like petite, you don't think it's gonna be that scary to go up against her, but you do not want to be in a one-on-one -on -one I actually, against I Emily Fox. I actually love Emily Fox because she always seems to put herself in the right spot. Yep. Even for some of those counters, just to like flip that on a dime, it's frustratingly good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good. It's great to see her there and we'll see how she matches up with my other player, Midge Purse, because Midge plays on the right side, uh, Emily Fox playing on the left battle. side there. So I, yeah, I'm really, really <laughs> taking a look at this battle here. Obviously Midge Purse scored the goal in the sixth minute against Casey Current, getting them up uh, on the score sheet first there before they ended up tying that match two to two um, in the second half. But uh, Midge is just such a creative player. You know, she can really just dribble down the field. She can also make the crosses. She can also score goals on her own. But I just, I love the added factor that she has in her combination with Yasmin Ryan up there. Mm -hmm. It's completely game changing for them. I love the fact that they've added Esther Gonzalez into the mix as well. So I have Gotham uh, winning it Woo! here. I know that you know you're a big advocate for North Carolina Courage, and you have we, been I all season like long. I feel like we are in a home of like very Gotham heavy fans. So somebody but, needs to flip it. But North Carolina <laughs> Courage is at home, which does make a difference. Home advantage matters. So we'll see how Gotham end up doing against them. And and this is going to be a great match, and, and I'm really excited to come back and talk about how it all plays out because we all have different <laughs> ideas of like where the uh, matchup of the game is and mm -hmm. I love that you picked the midfield and I, and I love everything here. Um, but let's continue where we will um, preview the next match. When we come back from a break, we're going to preview the match between OL Reign and Angel City who are set to play their first ever postseason match in club history. Keep it here. Rapino takes control, takes a shot, and it's in! There's a shot, and it's in again! Megan Rapino taking over! OL Reign needed to win to get into the postseason, and guess what they do? Vignola! And flicks it over, showing off a little skill now. It's in the box, and McCaskill makes it three! Post picks B, a So much for Portland to play for as the postseason begins. 
Oh, well, Rain are looking for their first postseason victory since 2015, while Angel City are looking for their first ever victory in the playoffs. Can Becky Tweed continue her incredible turnaround, or will the Rain make their fifth consecutive semifinal? Let's go ahead and break all of this down. Darian, give us what you think is going to happen in this match and your players to watch here. Ooh. Ooh, I think ACFC is going to take it. They're in good form. They're peaking at the exact right time that they needed to. Becky Tweed, I think, is feeling herself. She's got the buy-in from the team. I think they're going to take the cake. My player to watch for Angel City is Savannah McCaskill. Player of the month. She's led this team. She has the most goals. She has an assist on board. I think she is in such good form right now. Um, she had the game-winning goal against Houston, which gave them their playoff push that they needed to stay in it and she scored in their last match against Portland um, which they scored four goals in 15 minutes I think that just goes to show this team is really feeling themselves they're really playing cohesive and together and five different goal scorers that is crazy to happen in the NWSL so I think that this team is just playing together look at her celebrate I love that she is just having fun and you can see the joy I think it's spreading to her teammates she's going to be the key for them to what I think win this game but on this OL right side, if they play together, this team full of superstars, individual brilliance, they can win because they've been in these positions before. I think Jess Fishlock is my player to watch. She drives this team. She has four goals, one assist on the year. Um, she's formidable. Uh, I hope, you know, she, even if they don't win, I hope she puts one away and we see some sort of celebration because the last two seasons we've loved seeing that from her and the joy she has while she's playing. But she's been consistently such a staple for the success of this team. Um, she's calm on the ball. She distributes well. Her commitment to the box, her free kicks. Um, the only thing I think about, though, is if this stays tied till the end and even an extra time and they go to penalties, Ovo Rain has the advantage of arguably the best penalty taker in the world on their team mm -hmm. in Pino and such decorated veterans who have been in high pressure situations and taken penalties before. I would give them the leg over Angel City because you know, ah. they're, Plus the they're Laura such a Harvey young effect. team. Yeah. An yeah. added caveat there because Megan Rapinoe is the one who scored those two goals mm -hmm. um, in, against Chicago Red Stars and then Fishlock getting on the scoreboard there at the end. But that's a really, really interesting penalty taking situation there. Rapinoe is taking her retirement run very seriously. Oh, yeah. As she should. Going out with a bang. Right? Yeah. So for the OL Reign, my pick is Bethany Balser. Uh, sometimes OL Reign target woman integral to their advancement of the ball on the pitch. Six goals, one assist this season. I think that uh, she certainly um, is going to be a threat this match. You have to keep an eye on her. If you do let her run, you're done for. Um, absolutely lethal with headers, too. You just want to always watch out for her. Oh, you know she scores header goals yeah. all the time. And those balls whipped in from Sofia yeah. Huerta and Pino. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a big threat. And then my second uh, for Angel City is Emma Vignola. Uh, I guess I have a theme today with the youth because she's fairly young, <laughs> right? Defender just got called up for U.S. Women's National Team friendlies. But um, as an aside, two goals in 15 matches. But more recently, that recent goal is absolutely gorgeous that mm -hmm. she just had. Um, inarguably, I'd say one of the best fullbacks in the league. So she'll be holding down that back line. Not that she needs much help because Angel City are pretty locked and stacked back there. Yeah, they're pretty good. And you know what? I loved last game watching her relationship with Emsley. I mm -hmm. think that left side is a huge part of their success and how they balance off of each other and are kind of rotating positions and their fluidity to go um, have some underlaps, some overlaps in their combination play to break down the outside back and the winger of the opponent is going to be integral to their success in hopefully winning this match. Yeah. That's what I got my money on. You mentioned Bethany Balser, and I know that we've been making shouts on the on the show about who should be on the national team, but I feel like she deserves a call-up just for her goal-scoring mm -hmm. ability. She has a nose for goal, and she comes in and out no matter who the manager is. She never really seems to get like consistent, consistent time, but something about her, no matter how many minutes she plays, she's going to put the ball in the back of the net, and I think that that's what you know, she that's absolutely That's a good show, yeah. especially since she absolutely has no hesitation in putting her head in the box there. Yeah, she's fearless. And the, the last person that I'd say is that fearless would be like Julie Ertz, yep. and we no longer have her. Ah. So give her a space. shout, yeah. Kyla. <laughs> yeah, continuing on um, the OL Reign side there, I have Emily Sonnet just because I love yep. that midfield. I really did like to see her with the U.S. national team playing in that sixth position in the last match, um, seeing how she plays with Quinn there and Jess Fishlock in that midfield just kind of works out for OL Reign. I know that they've been you know struggling for, for quite a bit there, but as Emily Sonnet's 
gets her feet under herself in that sixth position continually. I feel like that's exactly what we're going to see here for the national team as we move forward here. Um, but I, I think she's a good shout to kind of pay attention to in this match, especially that midfield there. In um, the next team, Amadine Henri, um, because there is really no one who has won as much as her. I am. Um, <laughs> She's incredible, okay? She is. She has a 19-year career. She has 32 trophies for club and country. Obviously, she played for France, and she was amazing for them. Uh, but that midfield with Madison Hammond and Savannah McCaskill is so different. I know you already mentioned Savannah McCaskill and everything that she has won um, this year. I think, what was it? She Player of the Month for the Player NWSL? Player twice. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Um, I think that it works in that midfield. Like she, yeah. Savannah can't be herself without the players around her, including Madison and Amadine. And I and I like to see how they work together in that midfield. So I picked two midfielders there um, for that matchup, and I picked the left defender and the right attacker in the other <laughs> match. But this is all midfield here. Um, but all right, give me give me your last predictions here. Um, how it's going down? I'm gonna go. Angel City. I think Angel City is going to take the cake. Peaking at the right time. They have good yeah. chemistry. Everyone's scoring goals. That's who I'm rocking with. I'm going Angel City. Ooh, the we new agree. kids, I know. I, I really wanted to lean, go Harvey, <laughs> but you know what? The new kids. That's exactly what I'm thinking, though, mm -hmm. because they don't have experience in this, in this post-playoff. You know, they're so new. A little more freedom. Yeah. yeah. Maybe that lack of pressure. The, right. yeah. the burden of having won mm -hmm. is not upon them yet. Right. Yeah. And they've done so well under their interim coach, so it's great to see that there. Yeah. What about you, Jenny? I also agree. Angel City. Just the wow, fact what we've seen agree. against we Portland this past weekend, I mean, they have it in them to kind of just be peaking at the right time like you mentioned there. Angel City. We're rocking with Angel you. Angel City. All right. Thank you guys so much for joining us today on Attacking Third. We're going to be back on Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern to talk about all of the weekend's matches. Have a fantastic postseason weekend.